Kriyan Timidandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Unmili Tamina Tasma Shri Gurvina Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pachari Nenir Visesa Sunyavari Pasyati Adai Sutai Vancha Kalpa Tu Vishya Kriva Sindhu Vedacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Tavu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Siva Sri Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shri Lata Vipad Ki Jai So the living entity in the material world is in a awkward and unnatural state. <laughs> the, we have come to this material world because of our wrong mentality. And, and therefore here we are. Mitche Maira Base, Kachu Base, Kachu Habu Bubu Bajiv Krishna Dase Vishwash, Kolabara Dukanai. Life after life after life going from one material situation to another. Karanam guna sangha syo sarasa joni jangmasu. The living entry traverses throughout the material of tabernacle from one material situation to another, one universe to another. Struggling, trying to find some happiness, some success in their endeavors. But this is not possible because this is not our home. <laughs> We belong with Krishna in the spiritual world. Jivir, Surupai, Krishnera, Nityadas. All living entities are eternally part and parcel of Krishna. We have the same nature of Krishna and we are eternally related to Krishna through the process of devotional service. Because we come to the material world, we forget all that. <laughs> and we try to eke out a program to become happy here and therefore this is called hard struggle for existence this is what the human life is defined at just to somehow exist but nobody can exist here because the material world is dukalayam asasratam it's temporary and it is fraught with so many miseries but every living entity has this eternal quality of wanting to be happy. That we can't change. We all want to be happy, but we're trying to be happy in a place where there is no happiness. Like trying to find water in the desert. If you're in the desert and you are thirsty, you may think, I can find water. And you look, and you may even imagine there's water. And that's the living entity in the material world imagines there's some kind of happiness here. And they chase after it in forms of various types of sense uh, gratification. But no one's happy. Why? Because it's not our nature. Our nature is to love Krishna. <laughs> Prema Pumarta Mahan is actually the real quality of the living entity is to develop that love, but that love actually doesn't have to be developed, it's there. But it's covered. <laughs> and so there's a way to, again, come back to that position of eternal happiness and unlimited ha freedom and unlimited knowledge. And that is the process of bhakti. Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita what is that process of bhakti to render devotional service to him through his bona fide representative, the spiritual master. Krishna comes in the form of the bona fide spiritual master. The bona fide spiritual master is not Krishna, but he is the representative of Krishna. And because he represents Krishna, he can give what the living entity is looking for an opportunity to reconnect with Krishna 
through the process of serving Krishna with devotion. And so, in order to become successful in that process, one must accept a spiritual master. Accepting a spiritual master is not optional. Why is it not optional? Because the human life, the human form of life is meant to reawaken our eternal love for Krishna. And the process as given by Krishna himself, himself is to accept his representative as the way to again connect with him. It's Tadviti, uh, what is it? Tadvigyartam gurum apigatsche. That it's not, not optional. Taking a spiritual master is a requirement in order to achieve the goal of life. And so, I'm speaking to everyone. I'm not just speaking to the candidates. <laughs> I'm speaking to those who haven't taken that step yet. That you should all consider. You're all here giving your best wishes, blessings, and understanding to this ceremony. But you all should also think, I need to get my turn. <laughs> because otherwise, the human law form of life is not fulfilled. The human form of life is simply meant, and it's rare. Srila Prabhupada explains, to take a human birth is not something, uh, what we say, routine, or it is something that comes so easily. It comes only after millions and millions of births in this material world. And to get that human form of life means to know, know the value of that human form of life. And that human form of life is meant to awaken that eternal relationship with Krishna. And the spiritual master is the mercy manifestation of Krishna. He represents Krishna in the form of giving knowledge of how to serve Krishna and how to uh, act in such a way that Krishna will be pleased by our activities. To please Krishna is the goal of life. But it's so hard to please Krishna because Krishna is so great and he's so, he is or we say ahoksaja, he's beyond the range of our senses. How do we know Krishna? How, do we, how can we please Krishna? In order to know how to please someone, you have to know the person. And there's where the spiritual master gives you the understanding of this is, this is how you please Krishna. But he makes it easy. Krishna is difficult. He's not easy to approach because he's, he is the Supreme Personality of God and to approach him, one has to be pure. So we, although we are not pure, we can still approach Krishna through his representative, the bona fide spiritual master. And therefore, it's a great fortune to come to this stage of accepting Krishna in the form of the process of devotional service. And then, Tattva Deham Purna Janman in 1982, that we can go back home, back to Godhead. This is our eternal home. We don't, we don't belong here. And it's a fact, we don't belong here because we can't stay here. <laughs> We have to give up this body at some point and then accept another body, Mitche Mayaravase, life after life, Samsara Dava Nalalita Loka. Life after life after life after life, one body after another until we finally come to the understanding what am I doing? <laughs> I have to find, why can't I find that satisfaction, that happiness, that eternity that I'm looking for? It's not here. But it's there in our nature because we are eternal. We are not this material body which is temporary. Therefore, our eternal nature connects with devotional service and it becomes awakened. It becomes awakened. So to come to this process of devotional service is a great fortune. It's a great blessing. And this is the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's the mercy of the, all of the previous acharyas whose only goal, whose only focus is to elevate, lift up the conditioned souls who are suffering this world and bring them back to Krishna. That is their only business. That's what they think about and that's what they act on 
24 hours a day. That's their only business. And so we are receiving so many opportunities to come to the pro platform of finding that success in life that we are looking for. Here it is, devotional service to Krishna. And by accepting his representative and following the instructions of his representative. Now, I've seen so many times that, you know, on initiation day, everybody is like, I'm so happy I'm getting initiated. But after a couple of years, uh, don't forget the initiation day. Keep that mood with you. That mood of something wonderful is happening and something wonderful is about to unfold. Maya will test us. That's her job. Material energy is arranged in such a way as to help us become purified by giving us tests. And sometimes those tests seem to be difficult or impossible. But we should not, we should understand by, by the mercy of the spiritual master, as Srila Prabhupada was asked one time by one devotee, Prabhupada, I have so many obstacles. Prabhupada says, you come to me, I can kick out all those obstacles. He did that too when he was, boom. The spiritual master can remove the obstacles. What is our power? Our power is that we are connected to Srila Prabhupada. We don't have any power. We are simply connected to the source of power. As long as we remain connected to the source of power, that same power is available. That same power is available. And therefore, it's coming from Krishna. Evam param param praptam evam raja sayo Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita. So we are in a, a situation now that we can solve all our problems of life. And that means to go back home, back to Godhead. And the process of devotional service, getting back home to Godhead, is susukam kartam abhyayam. It's joyful. And what is that joyfulness? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Ram. Hare Ram. Ram Ram. Hare Hare. If we can t understand that this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the sunam bodham, the essence of all of our purification in the process of Krishna consciousness, and associating with devotees in the mood of service, these two things, if you keep these foremost in your practice of devotional service, you'll never have any difficulties. Never. Sadhu Sangha. Namuchi, and then of course Bhakti Vinoda Thakur adds one more, Jivadoya. When you have something wonderful, what do you want to do? You want to give it to others, right? If something is making you happy and you want to share that with others, that's a source of ha that's a source of greater happiness for you to assure, to share what makes you happy or what fulfills you in your life. That is love. So this is a, so take this process seriously. The initiation share money, as Srila Prabhupada said, is the beginning. It's not the end. <laughs> Don't think it's now that I got initiated, I got a name, I'm a dasi and a das. No, that's just the beginning. That means you, you've been practicing to begin and now you're actually beginning your process of going back home, back to God where life is eternal full of knowledge and without any COVID viruses. <laughs> it's, a, it's a process of unlimited happiness and you can even experience a, to, a, to a greater degree than happiness now if we take this very seriously. It's the most serious thing we can do because it means that this is what we've been looking for for millions of lives, the opportunity to again connect with our eternal loving relationship with Lord Sri Krishna. So thank you for coming forward and taking this process to heart and engaging in the process of devotional service. We wish you all the best. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.
Thank you, Chandra Mali Maharaj, for your enlightening talk, encouraging talk. Prabhupada once explained initiation as the opportunity to give up our false ego and to accept a real ego, that I am dasa, 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 anudasa, or dasi, dasi, anudasa. In other words, initiation is successful when we act in our relationship with Krishna as his, the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. And the process, as Krishna explained in the Bhagavad Gita, is, has four phases. One of them is that we hear that Krishna is God, and being God, he is the sonam bonam, the source of everything, the most desirable goal, unlimitedly bliss, full of knowledge, full of uh, uh, wealth, full of fame, full of renunciation, full of strength, six opulences, and full of beauty. Mm. And we hear about him from the devotees. Now we ourselves, or at least I can say myself, I'm trying to repeat what I've heard according to my realization, if it's going to actually have some value. Now, it just so happens there's a super soul in everyone's heart, and therefore, somehow or another, we can understand what's being said in relation to Krishna. And according to our sincerity, Krishna is telling us within the heart what the speaker is saying, whether Krishna is the speaker in Bhagavad Gita, or we're hearing it outside from his representatives, or reading Srila Prabhupada's books, that somehow or another we're understanding this knowledge in so far as we hear with attention, try to remember what we've heard, try to see what we've heard, try to understand how to apply what we've heard, and then apply it within our lives. And that application should be with steadiness and with enthusiasm. Pretty poor of a Yukta, steady, and pretty, with love, with enthusiasm. So love and enthusiasm comes in different stages. Sometimes it just may mean being steady in whatever we're doing every day. Just like Sula Prabhupada said, there was one lady in Vrindavan, this is 1972, and Sula Prabhupada was giving his lectures about the nectar of devotion and at the Radha Damodar temple in Vrindavan. And every day one lady would come with some water from the Jamuna, when it was actually the Jamuna, and would water the Tulsi plants there. And she did this every day and probably pointed her out and said because of this constant service she's doing, she's going to go back to Godhead. So steadiness and with some pretty, with some appreciation, some affection, some enthusiasm, and ultimately with some love. Then Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam. Then Krishna, within our heart, he'll explain what the science of Krishna consciousness is. And the science of Krishna consciousness means that everything becomes simpler. It's not that if you go to Vrindavan in the spiritual world that all the gopis, they speak Sanskrit and they quote from the Bhagavad Gita. If you go there, you can't learn materialistic sciences. They don't, of course, I think it's Hindu Leka. Who is it that knows astrology in the spiritual world? There's one of them. Tanga Vidya. Tanga Vidya? Who is... Who's our astrologer? Anyhow, one of them is expert in astrology. But she always figures, she does prashna. 
but when Radha and Krishna should meet each other. <laughs> Nothing else is really very important. <laughs> and she, she knows Tritila's chart, so she knows <laughs> what the obstacles may be. In any case, if we go there, what, you're going, what we're going to learn is how to churn butter. <laughs> and maybe making some gober patties, cow dung patties, and how to sew garlands. And you may learn how to dance, but not exactly like this. <laughs> they have a different dance there. And how to sing. There are 64 arts that actually Krishna Balaram learned from Sandipani Muni. But they're all utilized to please Radha and Krishna, to please Krishna's devotees. Uh, there's nothing very complicated. There's desire trees there. If you go and ask a desire tree for a Mac computer, it could give it to you. <laughs> but since eternity, no one has ever asked for a Mac computer. They only ask for flowers and fruits and different paraphernalia to serve Radha and Krishna. Because people don't have to improve their memories there because they have perfect memories of Radha and Krishna. And that's perfect memory. Now, this chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra, Shri Prabhupada, well, first of all, I would have to say that Shri Prabhupada has given us all these ceremonies coming down through our disciples' succession. Prabhupada has modified it so to suit our present mentality. Of course, we, we tend to make it a little bit more complicated than he did, but any a little bit more elaborate. But probably gave us a very simple ceremony, and all based upon the chanting of the holy names to impress upon us the value of the chanting of the holy name and how to do it without offense. So at every initiation, probably we'd always have the devotees recite the ten offenses, the speaker. I remember one time, probably was in, in a lecture. And when Sanyasi was giving the lecture about initiation on behalf of Prabhupada, and the lecture went on and on and on, and Prabhupada probably said, stop, ten offenses. Explain the ten offenses. Because if we can chant the Hare Krishna without offense, then what will be the result? What will be the benediction we receive? What will be the reward? We'll actually remember Krishna and his associates. With devotion. Uh, therefore, the whole ten offenses are meant to instill within us the idea of how important it is to perform devotional service steadily with love and enthusiasm to please Krishna and his devotees. So Krishna will be kind upon us and he'll, re he'll come to us not outside with the flute and dancing. He'll come to us in our memory will remember him with devotion. And if we remember him with devotion, then the result is we'll be able to feel his presence and all our misgivings, all our ignorance, all our lack of understanding of reality will immediately, well, will gradually diminish. And we'll be able to feel the love, devotion that the residents of Vrindavan have for Radha and Krishna and their associates. So there are ten offenses. The first offense is the blasting the devotees who have dedicated their lives in propagation of the holy name of the Lord. So the actual positive side of that is that when we see a devotee, we should become enthusiastic. Now that here comes a devotee, I better run because I, I don't like him. I may commit offense. <laughs> well, that may be better than offending the devotee, but actually the import of the first offense that we should avoid is that we should be enthusiastic to serve the devotees. And not only the devotees, whoever we meet, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Yari Deka Tari Kaha Krishna Upadesh. We only have one business in the material world, which should make our lives very simple. Our only business is that whoever we meet, we should think, what can I do? What can I think? What can I say to help this living entity make advancement in their relation with Krishna? That's all we have to do. We don't have to do anything else. And if you're not in association with anyone else, 
then you should think, what can I do to help further this, my own consciousness, how I can improve my attitude towards Krishna and his devotees by hearing the scriptures, by chanting Hare Krishna, by serving the deities, by serving the devotees, by trying to make the atmosphere spiritual, and somehow or another assist Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement in some way or another. So if we do that, if we engage in that service, then surely Dadami Buddha Yogam Tam. Krishna says he, after hearing about him, after becoming determined to become a devotee of Krishna, after learning how to perform worship to Krishna, after getting some appreciation for the process of devotional service and performing it steadily, and then after giving up other things besides Krishna, things that distra- giving up the things that distract us from Krishna, after giving up our association with those in the past and the present who distract us from Krishna, then the result is that we should become, as China Malimar said, enthusiastic to give this knowledge to others. And then Krishna says, one who's come to that platform, they become very dear to him. Because Krishna has probably once wrote to me that uh, Krishna, that I've heard in Buffalo that you've distributed, uh, then in New York they distributed 3,000 back to Godheads in just two weeks. I never heard that in Buffalo you're also distributing back to Godhead very nicely. So can, please continue in this way, and your success in life is assured. As Krishna sees that you're working seriously to br- help bring his other children back to the spiritual kingdom, then he'll bestow all his blessings upon you. That Krishna is never ungrateful for our efforts to serve him, rest assured. Then, the second offense is consider, consider the names of the demigods like Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma to be equal to or end, independent of the holy name of Lord Vishnu. So for most people in the Western world, there's no problem with this offense because we don't believe in Shiva, we don't leave, believe in Brahma, and we hardly, hardly believe in Vishnu. <laughs> so if someone tells us that Vishnu is better than Brahma and Shiva, we think that's no problem. <laughs> Whoever they are, let them fight it out amongst themselves. <laughs> I'll accept whatever you say. <laughs> but here we don't know about Brahma and Shiva, except we have, you know, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Michael, what was it, Michael Jordan? What? Jackson, yeah. <laughs> or we have some football star or whatever. So we we may think that Vishnu may be on an equal level with them. (laughs) But some of them can really dance, you know. (laughs) So we have to understand something, actually what Krishna is, and stretch our imagination. Because how can we imagine, how can we really imagine someone who's unlimitedly beautiful? You mean he's like almost like Marilyn Monroe, or <laughs> <laughs> he's ten times more beautiful than she is? Are you sure? <laughs> the frog in the well. <laughs> so this we have to meditate on. We don't know Shiva. We don't know Brahma. We heard about him today in class. <laughs> Someone says he has snakes around his neck or something, so his, his body is full of ashes and Brigamuni didn't want to touch him. So anyhow, he's an interesting personality. <laughs> <laughs> and Brahma has four heads, even more interesting than that. <laughs> <laughs> and Vishnu, well, he lies on a bed of snakes. I mean, <laughs> you can't, I mean, there's up there with the rest of them. <laughs> In any case, we have to hear, try to understand, and as we become connected with the super soul within our heart, as we become connected with other living entities, as we become aware of how Krishna's 
at least controlling everything in this world, including ourselves, <laughs> then we'll develop more of an appreciation for how great Krishna actually is. Third defense is to uh, minimize or disobey the orders of the spiritual master. I always get that mixed up with the fourth offense, but anyhow, I think that's the third one. So, the spiritual master, who is the spiritual master? Uh, Krishna is the spiritual master. He's actually in everyone's heart, so those who are giving initiation, they're not the only ones who have Krishna in the heart. That may come as a surprise to some of you. <laughs> but actually, Krishna is in everyone's heart. And not only that, but Krishna is an equal opportunity employer. He gives everyone equally remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness according to what they deserve and what they desire. So who is the spiritual master? Basically, a spiritual master, whether initiating or shiksha, giving instructions, is one who's understood to some extent that actually everyone is Krishna's servant and everyone should be engaged in Krishna's service. And he can explain how to engage in four activities by which one can become elevated back to one's original consciousness. So the first one is that one should serve Krishna in the nine processes, beginning with hearing and chanting. So that's what the spiritual master talks about, that how to hear, chant, remember, serve the deities, etc. And then he gives instructions that that should be done in the association of devotees. And the association of devotees is an opportunity for loving exchanges. Uh, we are associating with each other uh, specifically for that reason, to engage in offering gifts and accepting gifts, offering prasadam and accepting prasadam, revealing one's mind and confidence, and accept and inquiring confidentially. Of course, these are all in relationship to Krishna. We're not inquiring about who's going to win the horse race. That's not the inquiry. The inquiry is specifically about the topics of Krishna consciousness, hearing devotees' realizations. Therefore, the best time to meet a devotee is usually during class, especially if they're giving class. <laughs> if they're falling asleep, at least they're peaceful. But the best time to hear from a devotee is when they're giving class because then they're giving the best realizations they have to others. And the devotees who are in the class, they're hearing, hopefully, and therefore they're hearing confidential knowledge, the most confidential knowledge of how to love Krishna. And offering gifts, the best gift Prabhupada gave was the Hare Krishna mantra. One time he offered Robert who later on became, initiated as Jagannath Das, he offered Jagannath Das a piece of paper with a Maha Mantra on it, and he offered it in such a way as that Jagannath Prabhu, he thought that Prabhu was offering him more than a million dollars. He offered it so devotionally. And we're... So that offering of Krishna consciousness to others is the most valuable gift. At the end of the life, it's the only gift we can take with us. I can, and accepting charitable gifts. That if someone's offering a very valuable gift and you won't accept it, then it's very unfortunate. We have to learn how to accept this valuable gift of Krishna consciousness. We have to learn how to accept the gift of association with the devotees. We have to learn how to accept the process of devotional service as the most valuable gift. And that's done appropriately. So the spiritual master is one who has a vision of who is on what level of Krishna consciousness and can himself <coughs> reciprocate with the devotees accordingly respect those who are on neophyte level, who are just beginning Krishna consciousness, learn how to cooperate and serve those on the same level, and how to take instructions and faithfully serve those devotees who are more advanced than we are 
an undeviated devotional service and have more appreciation for the devotees than we have. And it can explain to us how we can de develop proper appreciation for the devotees also. So the spiritual master instructs us who our spirit, other spiritual masters are. If he's, got, if he's actually a spiritual master, then he can instruct us who we should reciprocate with according to their level of devotional service, either by respecting them within our minds, cooperating with them to spread Krishna consciousness and perform activities of devotional service, or who to take as guides for our development, who has more enthusiasm than we have, who has more devotion than we have, who has more appreciation than we have, who's more steady in devotional service than we are, who's more regulated than we are. These are our shiksha gurus. These are our actual gurus. And if we serve them and appreciate them, then we can make advancement. If we love the spiritual master, we appreciate him, and we disrespect the other devotees, then Sri Jiva Goswami and Sri Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur has said, it's just like you're fanning the deity with one hand and you're stepping on the deity's foot with another hand. That kind of service is not going to be appreciated very much. So the spiritual master teaches us how to see our other spiritual masters, and there's so many of them. The more advanced we are, then the more we'll see others, the good qualities they have, and learn from them and take instruction from them and therefore get, uh, obtain their good qualities and give up the fault-finding mentality because as long as we have a fault-finding mentality we'll appreciate some devotees and they'll help us advance and at the same time we'll go backwards by criticizing other ones. When we criticize other devotees we lose all the good qualities they have and if we appreciate the devotees then we gain all the good qualities they have. If we appreciate the law, wrong devotees, then we lose all the good, the, the good qualities they have and we'll gain all the bad qualities they have. If we appreciate devotees wrongly for their bad qualities then, and we don't see their good qualities, but see their bad qualities and appreciate them, that's what all the, their bad qualities will acquire. So it's an art. So basically speaking, what we should worry about the most is that we should try to seek the good qualities in the other devotees. We don't deny devotees have bad qualities, but we don't take them as very significant. Because our aim is to serve the devotees. And if we're aiming to serve the devotees, if we see sometimes devotees have bad qualities, that's all right if the aim is to help them if it's possible overcome those bad qualities and acquire good qualities. And if we see the good qualities in devotees, especially, then we should take them as a kind of spiritual master. When Sri was giving, was giving his lecture, he was explaining how the spiritual master sees others, other devotees. He said, actually the spiritual master doesn't think himself to be a spiritual master. He thinks that actually he's a servant of his spiritual master. And that by the mercy of the super soul within a heart, his heart, he's helping his, him remember his spiritual master and his instructions in disciple succession. And when he gives his followers or his disciples instructions, then he knows they're not coming from him, but they're actually coming from his spiritual master by the mercy of the of the acharyas and the super soul. And when he sees his disciples or his followers following those instructions, then he learns from them how to become a better servant of his spiritual master. So in that way he takes his followers and disciples as a kind of spiritual master. But we may take the spiritual master as an ordinary person. After all, in this material world we've been trained up how to see things from a materialistic point of view. So the spiritual master may forget verses. He may even fall asleep sometimes. He may do so many different things. That we, just like one time, one of our spiritual masters was in a class and some boy walked in 
And he stopped the class and said, look, my God, look, he has glasses on. And they were telling me he was perfect. So he got up and left. Both. No, only the boy left. <laughs> and the speaker kept his glasses on, by the way. <laughs> so our conception of what perfect is, is imperfect. And therefore we have to learn what actually the spiritual master's duty is, is to actually, a spiritual master, his perfection is how he's trying to help others become Krishna conscious how he's accepted the instructions of his spiritual master and he's trying to apply them in his life and help others become Krishna conscious too. So to that extent, whoever does that, yari da deka tarikaha krishna upadesh amara aiga gurahana taridesh, whoever does that becomes the spiritual master in the real sense of the term. There may be initiating gurus, there may be shiksha gurus, but they all have the same service that is to help their followers, help their disciples, help whoever they can help revive their relationship with Krishna by repeating and the words of the acharyas and disciples succession by the mercy of the super soul and try to apply those same instructions with one's own life. This is an example. So the fourth offense is the blasting of the Vedic literature or literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. Uh, we can read these books and most of it, most of it may, 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 we may think we know what's being said, but as Prabhupada points out, the illiterate Brahmin in South India who couldn't even read, but had faith in the scriptures, when as soon as he picked up the Bhagavad Gita, then at once he remembered Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, and he remembered how Krishna was so kind that although he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he took the role of a charioteer for Arjuna, and therefore, thinking of how kind Krishna is, this Brahmin who couldn't read the Bhagavad Gita started to cry. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said to him that you're actually the real knower of the Bhagavad Gita. We may read so many things in our scriptures and some of it may bewilder us. Well, most of it may bewilder us. We may not even read it. Hopefully we read it so at least we become eligible to become bewildered. <laughs> or at least understand we're bewildered. Right now we're so bewildered that we don't know we're bewildered. Or as Krishna Kaviraj Goswami wrote in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, that I'm so fallen that I think I'm advanced. So there may be so many things in the, in the scriptures, but actually they all connect to the same thing. To understand that we're simply servants of the servants of the servant of Krishna, and to try to do our service with steadiness and with devotion. All this fake, all this philosophy, all these things, stories we're hearing, everything is meant to bring us to that point. So we may not understand how there's a mountain made of gold, and that the demons and the demigods picked it up, and put it on the back of God, who is 40, was 120,000 kilometers on, as a tortoise, and put it on his back to scratch his back, and we think, my God. <laughs> I mean, I tell this to my friends. They really think I'm crazy. But. Therefore, sometimes we're embarrassed, you know, here, take this book, please don't read it, but give a donation. <laughs> No, we may not understand, and because we don't understand, therefore we may not have full conviction in everything it says, because we're just not qualified. We don't see how everyone and everything is connected to Krishna, and how great Krishna is. We judge things by our personal experience. But still, if we can find something in the books that actually apply to our lives, that we can actually see with our eyes around us, and can actually apply it with devotion, then that's the most valuable thing we can get from these scriptures. And if we hear something else that bewilders us, that we're doubt, doubtful about, that, you know, I, don't, I shouldn't be hearing this, but I heard it anyhow, 
then we should just be neutral and understand that we're in a present illusion. We don't even know who we are. We don't even know, we haven't even realized we're not this body. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when Sanatana Goswami told Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that people say I'm a great pundit, that I know Sanskrit, and I know Persian, I know so many different things, but actually I don't know anything because I don't know who I am. Now each one of us can ask ourselves right now, do we actually know who we are? We hardly know who we're not. Therefore people study astrology, they go to psychiatrists, they do so many things for years and decades to find out who they're not. (laughs) Well here, Prabhupada, Krishna, the devotees are telling us who we actually are, and that's the most important thing, that we're Krishna's servants. And all these other things are just to give us some indication of how wonderful and how great Krishna is. The fourth and the fifth and the sixth offenses give some interpretation of the holy name and to consider the chanting of Hare Krishna as to be imagination. Faith in the holy name is essential. We can only develop it if we actually understand that Krishna and his name are not different. That when we chant Hare Krishna, then we're actually Shrimati Ra- then actually Shrimati Ra- Rani and Krishna are present before us. They're there. But the only question is, where are we? So we should ask ourselves when we're chanting, where am I? Hopefully we're in the temple and hopefully we're awake. <laughs> and then we should think, I just chanted Hare Krishna, what was the effect? Did I actually perceive Radha and Krishna in the names? And if I didn't, what was the reason? Is it that actually this is all the exaggeration, that Radha and Krishna are really not there, they have better things to do than come to Ljubljana during the lockdown? They want to be free in Vrindavan. We have to ask us why I'm not perceiving Radha and Krishna when I'm chanting their names. Am I paying attention? Am I concerned about what happened yesterday, what's going to happen today, what's going to happen tomorrow? And if I'm paying attention, what mood am I paying attention to? Is it actually with love? Am I actually calling out to Shemati Rarani, complaining about the prasadam, complaining about things or morose or whatever? Or is it with love, calling out to Shemati Rarani, lovingly, to help to engage in their loving service. And if we do that, what would be the result? Then Krishna and Shemati Rarani and their associates will appear within our remembrance of them when we're chanting. Not artificially, but as a result of calling out their names with love and devotion and with attention. And that's the perfection of our chanting. Then the chanting will not become a heavy burden that why do I have to chant 16 rounds every day? As soon as I sit down, I th- I'm looking at my counter beads and thinking, oh my God, there's too many of them left. <laughs> my, what am I going to do? <laughs> Schnicking on. Oh, what, what a relief. <laughs> I feel so much better. <laughs> this is a great opportunity to associate with the Supreme Personality of Godhead and with his eternal associates. <laughs> then the seventh offense is commit sinful activities on the strength of the chanting of the holy name. That Maya is always there to encourage us to be in Maya. She is always praising us how wonderful we are, even as a devotee. Maya will never say, you're a bad devotee. Did you ever hear Maya say, you're a bad devotee? <laughs> no, Maya is the only one who praises us, usually. I will say, you're a great devotee. You need a break. <laughs> you deserve a break. <laughs> you know, this, you're such a great devotee. No, it wouldn't even make any difference if you fall down. You'd still be a great devotee. You'd great, be a great fallen devotee. So Maya will always try to encourage us to break the principles. You know, as one devotee, he was actually the head of Back to Godhead. And 
he left the movement. And Prabhupada didn't, and was disappointed. But he, later on he wrote to Prabhupada because he wanted to come back to the movement. Because he started to complain to all the devotees that Prabhupada, Swamiji at that time, he's denying real love. So it turns out to be that actually what, he had a boyfriend. <laughs> and Prabhupada told him he can't live with his boyfriend and be the editor of Back to Godhead magazine. <laughs> so he was going around telling everyone the Prabhupada was denying real love. And then finally he wrote back to Prabhupada and said, I want to come back to the movement and become, you know, take up my service again. Prabhupada said, fine, but you can't live with your boyfriend. <laughs> so Maya is very strong. Maybe it's not so obvious, but Maya will always try to encourage us to do something that we shouldn't be doing, all in the name of adding little spice to the holy name. The eighth offense is to Consider the chanting of Hare Krishna to be one of the auspicious ritualistic activities often the Vedas as fruit of activities of Karma Kanda. Uh, it's very hard to understand what eternity is like when you're in the illusory energy, when everything is temporary. And therefore the attractions of gaining some material asset is always there. Because we don't do it through Karma Kanda, we do it through our credit card. As long as we have we can use our credit card. We, we, we go and say the mantra by typing in the, the name of the credit card and all the details. And then magically, these things by the mercy of the material energy appear before us by it's the via media of Amazon. <laughs> and we think, yeah, this chanting is really working. It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> Everything I want is coming. As I said, there was one devotee who I knew. He was in Los Angeles. He inherited $25 million. This was like 40 years ago. And he became very excited. $25 million is probably $100 million now. He went back home, got his $25 million, sent back his beads, sent back his doties, sent back his books, and said, I don't need these things anymore. I, God has already benedicted me. So to understand the difference between eternal value, eternal achievement, eternal progress, and getting things temporary, we have to understand. Obviously, we're not going to engage in ritualistic karma kanda activities. And for most of us, we have so many things we think we need, so many things we're afraid of losing. But actually, what, we're, what we need is Krishna, and what we should be afraid of losing is our Krishna consciousness. That's the only thing we actually can get that's the only thing we can lose in this world, really. The ninth offense is to instruct the, faith, the, the glories of the Holy Name to the faithless. So in other words, we should try to explain Krishna consciousness in a way that can be apply, applicable to people. You have so much philosophy we may know. I remember I used to go out in certain parts of the world and our aim was to defeat the demons because we have so much knowledge. So we meet Christians and we defeat them. Prove from their Bible that actually thou shalt not kill. <laughs> but the result is the only person they wanted to kill was us. <laughs> so we should try to preach the Holy Name in an appropriate way that people can understand and take advantage of it. And the tenth offense is not to have complete faith in the chanting of the Holy Name and to maintain material attachments even after un and understanding so many instructions on this matter. It's also an offense to be inattentive while chanting. So it's difficult to give up material attachments, but we have to recognize when they're there. Usually they're presented to us one at a time. You know, Krishna says, this is our plan for the next six months to give up this material attachment. <laughs> and we have to work on it. As Prabhupada once said he, about the offenses against Lord Jagannath, he said, Lord Jagannath is 80% merciful. But if I told you all the offenses that you can commit against him, you'd faint. Therefore, generally speaking, Krishna presents one problem we have at a time, and then we work on it. 
And as soon as we get free from that problem, we think we're liberated. <laughs> I'm so advanced, you know, here, here's my foot, you can finally touch it. But w this lifetime, maybe, it may take more than one lifetime, because we may not be so quick to give up even one problem at a time, one anartha at a time. But we have to try to do it, and the best way of doing it is just chant Hare Krishna happily. Sit down with our beads, or wherever we are, and think this is an opportunity, rather, rather than a, a challenge. This is an op opportunity to chant Hare Krishna blissfully, and the result will be that when we come to Kirtan, then we'll actually be able to take advantage of Kirtan also. If we can concentrate our minds on Japa, then Kirtan's a breeze compared to Bhagapa. And Kirtan's another opportunity to hear from the devotees, not to only hear our sweet voice, which to us seems like nectar, but to actually try to learn how to hear other devotees' voices and hear them as nectar too. And if we do that, then the result will be our relations with everyone, with all living entities, will automatically improve. If you hear someone chanting Hare Krishna and you appreciate them for chanting Hare Krishna, then your rela spiritual relationship with them is becoming perfect. And if someone's chanting Hare Krishna and you don't listen to them, uh, well, you have some improvement to do. So, if we probably wanted us to remember these ten offenses, of course, sometimes we go over them every day in some temples and they become kind of routine. We don't really go into the depths of what they mean, but we should think about what, the, what it means to love Krishna, to love his devotees, to have faith in this process of devotional service, and when we're chanting Hare Krishna, to apply it within our lives and our activities. So thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.